Good afternoon and welcome to the dawn of new meaning when chapter comes open, chapter comes close to the edge where we carve a center, some place to begin from, some place to reflect from every day. We are coming out of some little place, going into spaces known as everywhere. You be the mountain like knowings of women and men who will ask you, someone will ask you, where do you receive your gifts and how do you give them back? Someone will ask you for droplets of your dreams somewhere past the flattery of these words, on the other side of the mountain known as language, half past history and how far we have come on the other side of time and how far we are yet to go. Someone will ask you, where do you receive your gift? And how do you give them back? Dumelang, Bacholo, colleagues and friends. My name is Natalia Mulebazi, and what an honor and a privilege it is for me to navigate you through today's program on this fourth day of the 2021 edition of the John Langalibalele Dube Memorial Lecture, courtesy of the University of KwaZulu Natal. Please note that the session is being recorded. This session is also live streamed on the UKZN Facebook page as well as the Twitter page. You will know that this series of lectures has been going on since 2003 to celebrate, to honor, to reflect on an extraordinary man, a leader, a scholar, a teacher, a farmer, a philanthropist. This man who also founded the Ilanga La Se Natal a newspaper that was also a political tool for him and his comrades to continue the fight for the liberation of all Black people. So you are all in the right place today, right now. And please allow me to ask Professor Antlan Tlamkize, who's the Deputy Vice Chancellor and head of the College of Humanities here at UKZN to welcome us. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Program uh, Director. Uh, on behalf of the Executive of the University of KwaZulu Natal, under the leadership of uh, Professor Nana Boku. It is my singular honor to welcome you to this uh, fourth webinar commemorating the 150th anniversary of our own Dr. John Langalibalele Dube. I would like to welcome in a very, very special way uh, some of our distinguished guests who are present today. Uh, amongst us today, we have the Honorable uh, Balega Mbete, the former Speaker of the National Assembly of the Republic of South Africa, as well as former Deputy President of the Republic. We are also pleased to welcome uh, the Honorable uh, Ms. Uh, Zodwa Monase, who holds a very, very distinguished place in our history as one of the very, very first uh, 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 women African uh, chartered accountants in the country. 
as you are aware, we are honoring Dr. John Langalibale Tube, as well as the legacy of women who were with him in this very, very long journey. I also want to welcome Professor King Costa, who is also amongst us as one of our international guests, as well as the uh, Honorable uh, Zanelle Fatuayo, who is a former mayor of the Umsumbuzi municipality. My apologies for that interruption. I would also want to welcome in a very special way, Ms. Zanele Fatuayo, the former mayor of Umsunduzi municipality, as well as our former judge of the constitutional court, Mr. Albi Sachs, as well as present with us today. Today, we'll also be introducing to a special book that has been coordinated by Professor Langa Kualo in honor of the legacy of John Langalibalele Dubai. This signals a significant milestone in the University of KwaZulu Natal's vision to be a premier university of, of African scholarship. True to the philosophy and the lived experiences of John Langalibalele Dube, who traversed the modern and traditional spheres effortlessly, the book weaves together the voices from academia and public as well as organic intellectuals in a seamless manner. The book comprises a series of memorial lectures that began in about 2003, when we started this journey of honoring the legacy of John Langanibale Dube in what was then the School of Religion at the University of KwaZulu Natal. With the major in 2004, and subsequently the establishment of the JL Dube Chair in Rural Education in the College of Humanities, we saw it fit to have annual memorial lectures in order to recognize the legacy of Dr. Dube, as well as the Dube family in terms of education and theology and entrepreneurship. Since then, the School of Education and the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics have co-hosted the memorial lectures on behalf of the college. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not possible to do justice to the profundity and the richness of thought that have been the hallmark of these lectures since they were initiated in 2003. Vision of African scholarship, I will leave it up to you to interrogate the lectures, read the book when you get an opportunity, and then with the chapters speaking in their own voice, you will be able then to fully capture the legacy of John Langalibalele Dube. All the chapters in this volume which cover, as I've already indicated, the inception of the memorial lectures in 2003 up to 2020, touch on the key aspects of the legacy of the Dubes. But I want to single out the issue of leadership, particularly selfless leadership and ethics being some of these aspects. The publication of the book is a fitting achievement to honor the theological, literary, community building and exemplary lives of the Dubes in general. The book comes at an important time 
when our country is facing a number of ethical dilemmas, which at times pose serious challenges to our constitutional democracy. At the same time, the world at large is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, which has deepened the social and economic divides in our communities. The book is a living inheritance from which current and future generations will definitely benefit. And I do want to point out that the generally narrative and engaging style of this book makes it accessible to everyone. So with those background words, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the College of Humanities, as well as the University of KwaZulu-Natal to welcome all of you and to declare this a webinar or meeting open. And I am sure that we will be able to understand and deeply appreciate the legacy of John Dangalil Balele Dube as well as the Dubes in general, as our distinguished scholars who will be presenting uh, to us today, take us through this journey. With those words, I thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Mkese, for welcoming us, for making us feel at home as we feast on African scholarship. If you've just joined us, welcome to the 2021 edition of the John Langalbalele Dube Memorial Lecture. And we are here to celebrate an extraordinary human being. If you've just joined us, please note that you are welcome to record your question or your comment um, in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, it is right there because we want this also to be an interactive and engaged session. Before I welcome the next speaker, I want to say you will turn sun up to compromise, moon earth onto sacrifice, shed a tear in resentment, be safe haven amidst the lives that wake from yours. And if no reflection returns here by dawn, perhaps then the photographs, the amulets, the facts stuffed inside big, big shoes and the letters soaked in blood and the soil in your hands. The floods of burden will all be brought out as testimony. When you search the gaping night below the rubble of awakenings, mixed with doubt and fear of flight, there will be a spark at the end, which is the beginning as we learn to speak anew, you will be a man, a great mother star, an island, a story spotted with questions, a universe, a monument, a moment, a world drinks a name as honor, your name. You will be an imposing monument and a tiny grain of drifting sand. You will call ululation on the people's tongues. And you will always be mirror, reflection, star shining from above. You will always be new ground, new, new ground. Baholo, friends, colleagues, I want to tell you something. If scholarly rigor was a person, if community building was a person, 
that would definitely be I mean, absolutely. She is going to come on now and give us the overview of the J.L. Dube Memorial Lecture Series and its significance in this 150th year as we celebrate, but also as we go through the COVID-19 pandemic. Professor Mulezani is the holder of this esteemed John Langalibalele Dube Chair in Rural Education. Please welcome her. Professor Mulezani, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a minute. Um, um, okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Natalia, for um, uh, those welcoming words. I wish I had half the words that Natalia has and had uh, the fluidity <laughs> that she has in using the words as well. Thank you, Natalia, for that um, uh, poem. Um, thank you, uh, colleagues, for being with us uh, this whole week as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of the birth of John Langali Balele Dube. In the few minutes that I've been provided, I would just like to provide a brief history an overview of the uh, John Langali Balele um, lecture. What I, I would uh, like to do then is to trace the lecture right from the beginning of um, 2003, when it was um, first um, hosted by um, the then School of Religion on the Peter Maritzburg um, campus. With this establishment of uh, the research chair named after Dube, the uh, John Langale Balele um, uh, research chair in rural education in 2010, the School of Education and the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics have collaborated in organizing and hosting the lecture on either the Peter Marisbeck um, uh, campus or the Edgewood campus where the School of Education is, is located. This is the second um, COVID era virtual uh, conference. The first was presented last year by Professor Noma Langam Kize, um, as I, would, I, I will outline. Welcome Professor Noma Langam Kize. I saw that she's in the, in the audience. I would also like to give you um, a brief history, uh, like a, 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 a snapshot of what the previous five lectures at least have focused on, just to give you a taste of what we've been covering. In 2016, Professor, the late Professor Ntongela Masilela looked at the South African intellectual and political uh, culture enabled by John Langa Libalele Dube in the founding of Ilanga Lase Natal in 1903. Dr. Maureen Tong addressed the topic of violence on and through the land, violence on women's bodies, evoking um, John Langalibalele's Dube's voice in contemporary debate. Then in 2018, Professor Chad Berry addressed the enduring power and promise of education, particularly higher education as a public good. 2019, Dr. Bongani Mulunga addressed the topic of um, from the pioneering generation, um, the generation of John Langali Balele Dube to the current generation of youth in the fallist movement. And as I said, Professor Nomalanga Mkize last year um, uh, asked us to locate the umbilical cord in Africa and why uh, we needed or why we need to resist the, uh, the temptation 
to locate our decolonization debates um, in uh, using Northern and Latin American academic trends. So why, are we, uh, uh, why is it important that we are celebrating um, the 150th anniversary of John Dubé's birth this year, uh, this, the COVID year? We know that uh, COVID-19 and the restrictions that uh, it has visited upon us have exacerbated already existing inequalities in our communities, in our institutions and in our families. Just as an example, Lisa Vettin um, reminded us of one of the uh, programs in South Africa, the, the Expanded Public Works Program, which employs and supports women from marginalized communities, women who would otherwise not have access to work. Pointing out um, that um, the majority of those employed in the program are women, but also that with the suspension because of lockdown, it means that those women have gone without any income for that period. And what are the implications for interventions and for our work as universities in that context? We also know that during lockdown, while there was a reduction in uh, criminal activity during level five lockdown, there was a sharp increase in intimate partner violence and domestic violence in communities. And yet the COVID-19 interventions that we have seen in South Africa have largely been medical and to some extent political while the humanitarian crisis that we are all witnessing in our communities has remained largely silenced or largely uh, ignored. So considering the impact of COVID-19 on communities and institutions, the questions we wanted to ask ourselves as a university and higher education in the higher education sector was or is, how might we draw on today's teachings, for example, of access to education, self-reliance, um, hard work, to integrate the needs of those whose livelihoods is dependent on the land, for example, those without access to uh, resources and livelihoods, and other man marginalized groups into our research and teaching in the context of COVID-19. So this week then, what we um, decided to do was we would hold, unlike in other years where we only have this one main lecture, that we would hold a series of lectures lasting for the week uh, to address um, some of the questions that were in our minds. And so on Monday, Professor Kaleni from the College of Health and uh, Health Sciences addressed the question of African traditional medicine and COVID-19 vaccines. Then on Tuesday, Mr. Mike Muendani and Mr. Lukona Mguni addressed um, the topic of land, climate change, and the role of higher education. Um, then yesterday, Professors Hugh, Professor Hugh, Heather Hughes and Dr. Deborah Mindri with Ms. Um, Nana Jali, one of Dube's uh, granddaughters, address the um, issue of unsilencing um, the two women who have gone largely silenced in our, in our history. So they uh, spoke about the role of those two women um, and their contribution to, what, uh, to the Dube legacy, if you will. Today's uh, lecture that is going to be presented by Professor Sharif Keita um, addresses the issue or the question that we are here about, which is celebrating the 150 years of, the, of Dr. John Langali Balele Dube, but also highlighting what lessons we might learn in the context of inequalities and in the context of the current pandemic. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Professor, for that overview and also just giving us insight into the hard and smart work that has been continuing um, in, in, in this space. Now, we are about to get into the meat of why we are here this afternoon and a prolific scholar, a documenter, um, a filmmaker, a writer in, in, in Professor Sharif Keita, who's just, his work is bottomless, is endless. So please allow me to call Professor Tabom Sibi, who's doing a very, very important um, task today, the Dean and Head of the School of Education, who is going to do the welcoming and the introduction of our main speaker today. Over to you, Professor Msibi. Thank you very much, Natalia, and a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my singular honor to introduce one of the most distinguished uh, scholars of Africa and one of the mo most prolific people to write, to compose, and to drive an agenda that seeks to transform this continent, Professor Sheriff Keita. He is a native of Mali. He's got his PhD from the University of Georgia in, and is the William H. Led Professor of French and Liberal Arts at Carleton College in Minnesota, where he teaches Francophone literature of Africa and also the Caribbean, as well as advanced languages courses. He has published widely on both social and literary, uh, in, sorry, literary issues in contemporary Africa. And he's written the novel and social change in Mali, oral tradition, and the relationship between music, literature, and popular culture in West Africa. Now, I have been practicing for some time to try and pronounce some of these uh, prolific titles. I hope, uh, Prof, that I don't butcher them, but uh, here we go. He's the author of Masa Makati Abate, Akriu Modak à la Rocconcre de l'Ectreture, which was published in 1995, and also of Salif Keita, Loiseau sur le fromage. And over here, I must say, uh, my tutor, told me that I must be careful of not pronouncing the R at the end because I'll be speaking of cheese instead of the tree. So I hope I pronounce it properly. And also Salif Keita, L'Ambassador de la Musique du Mali, which is published in 2009. He also has published Outcast to Ambassador, the musical odyssey of Salif Keita in 2011. He has directed and produced a trilogy of documentary films about a number of groundbreaking 19th century and 20th century Black intellectuals in South Africa, uh, such as Oberlin Inanda, The Life and Times of John Langella Bilidube, which is published in 2005. And it's important to note that this received a special mention at FESPACO. Um, he's also written about the first president of the ANC uh, in a book entitled The Cemetery, uh, uh, um, uh, in a production entitled The Cemetery Stories, A Rebel Missionary in South Africa in 2009. And Ogukumbula Unogutela, remembering Nogutela in 2014, about a forgotten woman pioneer in South, of the South African struggle for democracy. These films have been screened on many continents and have been covered by media outlets such as NPR, the BBC, the R, uh, RFI, and in newspapers in South Africa, West Africa, and in the US. His latest, latest film, Nambala Kita, a soldier and his village, which was published in 2020, tells a story of his late father's service in the French colonial troops, which was during World War II. He has led off-campus study programs to South Africa, Mali, and more, more recently to Senegal. You will tell by the people who have been attending or are in attendance in today's meeting that this is truly a prolific uh, scholar, distinguished, and we're very proud and excited as UKZN to be hosting him. Over to you, Professor Keita. Thank you. You are, you are muted, Prof. <laughs> All right, okay. Thank you so much, Professor Msibi, uh, Sambonani, uh, Dumelan, uh, bienvenue. Au Bismillah, I greet you from Northfield, Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes. 
Today's talk, I titled My Two Decades with the Camera in the Bush of Spirits. This coming January will mark the 22nd year of my what I consider my passionate and almost obsessive involvement with South Africa, an extraordinary spiritual and emotional experience at the heart of which lies a challenge by President Nelson Mandela in 2000. How did that happen? It began with my first trip to South Africa in January, 1999. I was then co-leading an off-campus programs for two Minnesota colleges, St. Olaf College and my own college, Carlton College, to study for a month the topic of poetry, performance, and the politics of identity in South Africa. After hearing the name of John Langalibalele Dube during that trip for the first time, not only as a pioneer educationist, but also as the founder of the African National Congress, I returned to the United States with a fervent desire to learn more about this unique but little known man, about his life and training in the US in the hope of consolidating his legacy for future generations. The more I thought about Dubé's life, the more I realized that film would be the best medium to bring him more vividly and more rapidly into the collective memory. But since I was not a filmmaker, I submitted my idea for a film to a good friend of mine, Mr. Mweze Ngangura, an award-winning filmmaker from the DRC, who was based in Brussels, Belgium. He was immediately hooked. Our plan was to build a story of my search for Dubé around a conversation with President Mandela who had paid a resounding tribute to John Dube by voting at Otlangi on April 27, 1994. So I wrote to Madiba's office, requesting a non-camera interview with him about Dube. He agreed in principle, but I asked that I send in my questions beforehand. With great excitement, I hastened to write a bunch of questions and send them to his office. A few days later, after examining those questions, Madiba replied that he really knew very little about Dube and that he would have to do research himself in order to answer my questions. Imagine that. Receiving Madiba's message about his inability to answer my interview questions, along with his best wishes that I succeed in my research project, my great excitement and hopes were suddenly dashed. I was, I, I was overcome by a terrible feeling of discouragement for I had suddenly missed my chance to meet in person such a giant of history. Luckily, I regained my composure, my spirit a few days later, once I realized that through this canceled meeting, Madiba had indeed offered me a unique gift by admitting his ignorance. I told myself that if Mandela at his age did not know much about Reverend Dube, the first president of a party and a movement he embodied in the eyes of the world, there was one important challenge to me and to younger generations to roll up our sleeves and dig out the information for everyone's edification. However, for me, this challenge was more daunting. Having failed to secure the most irresistible selling point for our film project, my initial partnership with a professional filmmaker fell apart. Although I kept my interest in Dubé's life story, my knowledge of South Africa's complex history amounted to very little. At that point, I was ready to give up, but a strange event happened. One late night, I was reading in bed, a book written by the son of Reverend William Wilcox, the American born missionary who brought John Dubé as a young boy to the US. At one point in my reading, I came across this line. My parents were married in my mother's hometown of Northfield, Minnesota in August, 1881. I could not believe my eyes. Northfield was my town. And now what I read was saying that John Dubé's connection to America was through the very town from which I had traveled to South Africa a year earlier. My heart was pounding in my chest. I quickly put the book down, 
thinking that for sure some evil spirit was playing a trick on me in order to drive me out of my mind. I decided that, I decided to wait a few minutes before picking up the book again. Out of caution, this time, I decided to start at the top of the page and read slowly until I got to the frightening line. I got there and it's said, it's still said, my parents were married in my mother's hometown of Northfield, Minnesota. I jumped out of bed and could not sleep for the rest of the night. I was waiting for day to break so that I could begin my research about the Wilcox couple's story in my own town at the public library located just a few blocks from my house. In essence, the Dube story that had started as a distant story had suddenly become a local story, even better, a personal story to me. I had found in the most unexpected way, my own connection to a story some people thought I had no legitimacy to be researching, let alone retell. Because they said, you are not a South African. In other words, instead of me finding the Dube story, the Dube story had found me. But I will come back to this question later. For a moment, let me tell you what the following years brought. In December 2004, I completed my first film, Oberlin Inanda, The Life and Times of J.L. Dube, 54 Minutes. In January 2005, it was selected for the Pan-African Film Festival to be held in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. This was truly a moment of triumph. My wish had been that a representative of the Dube family be present for the unveiling of this little known story to an international audience. I turned to President Tabombeki with a request for financial support. An old friend of mine with direct contact to the presidency guided me. President Becky responded positively to my request for help and sent Mr. Zanzile Dube, the grandson of John Dube, and my trusted companion and cheerleader to the festival in Ouagadougou, where the film attracted a lot of attention. Press coverage and even garnered a special mention for best documentary in a special prize category. This was followed by President Becky's letter of gratitude sent to me on behalf of the people of South Africa, written by Mr. Paolo Jordan, his Minister of Arts and Culture, along with a request that this first ever film about Dube be made available to SABC, the country's public broadcaster. Then in July 2005, I arrived in Durban with the film as part of the official selection of the Durban International Film Festival. The then Council General of India in Durban, His Excellency Ajay Swarup, sent some of his staff members to attend the first screening at Harvard College. He later contacted me with a request for a private showing of the film for an important member of the Durban Indian community. He explained to me that this person was very much interested in my film, but had limited mobility due to a stroke. This person turned out to be the renowned Professor Fatima Mir, whom I knew as a close friend of Nelson and Winnie Mandela and for her book, Higher Than Hope. I felt truly honored by this unexpected opportunity. I was even more honored when after watching the film with the Consul General, with Zay and myself in her living room, she asked if I had a copy of the film for Madiba because she wanted to have one hand delivered to him by her nephew, who she said was Mr. Mandela's lawyer and was scheduled to see him a few days later. What an amazing opportunity this turned out to be. I felt that through this channel, Madiba was now getting the result of the challenge he had placed on before me six years earlier to find out who JL Dube was. This was all the more important as Madiba's generation of revolutionaries had been conditioned to see the ones before who preceded them almost as too soft, as too prone to accept compromise. Thus, I applauded the opportunity 
I was having to shift Madiba's perspective of J.L. Dube by showing the double yoke of colonialism that he and his generation operated under. The double yoke of colonialism was the gray zone that preceded the days of apartheid when things became starkly black and white, so to speak. What followed the first film takes my narrative into a stranger direction. That is my dependence on the spirits for the success of my journey of two decades. As a person who was born into a Muslim family in an urban context and whose teenage years were shaped by Catholic education, I could not see at first the whole spectrum of African spirituality. Ancestors and spirits barely existed in my worldview, but my next steps were going to radically change that situation. Do you recall the circumstances under which I discovered that Mrs. Ida Bell Wilcox, whose maiden name was Clary, was a native of Northfield, Minnesota? You will remember that it is a late night mind blowing revelation that made it impossible for me to walk away from the Dube story. I was about to, to discover the real forces that were making me work so passionately, not only on John L. Dube, but also on a constellation of unheralded liberation pioneers that had lived in his orbit. That is William Wilcox, the man whom Dube used to call father, Ida Bell, whom he used to call mother, and last but not least, Nukutelam Dima Dube, his forgotten first wife. This is how it happened. After I finished Oberlin in Anda, I decided to look for the descendants of William and Ida Bell Wilcox to let them know about the amazing role their ancestors had played so early on in South Africa's liberation history a history I suspected they would not know too much about. The oldest descendant I found was Reverend Jackson Wilcox, 85 or 86 years old at the time, a resident of Fresno, California, 2000 miles away from Northfield, Minnesota. Blown away by his discovery about his family heritage, this new discovery, Reverend Jackson Wilcox offered to come visit me in Northfield along with his daughter, Deborah, a resident of Alaska, and his son, John Wilcox, a resident of North Dakota. This was April, 2007. At that time, I thought, well, it would be a good idea to find the family graves before they came, something that would make their trip even more worthwhile. To my greatest surprise, to my greatest surprise, I discovered that Jackson Wilcox, the old man, his maternal grand, great grandparents, his maternal great grandparents, Nathan Gove Clary and Anne Webb Clary, had their graves in a cemetery right behind my house. No more than a hundred meters behind my bedroom. How could I explain this? Was this a mere coincidence? No. Was this of a proof of my uncanny skill as a researcher? No, emphatically no. However intelligent one may be as a researcher, no one can create such a set of strange circumstances. I had to admit at that point that a transcendental phenomenon was at work here. Something that rational discourse could no longer account for. It is then that I began to realize that my involvement in the Dubai research in South Africa had been literally ordered and planned by some unappeased souls that were my neighbors in Northfield. This strange chain of events had started with my 1999 trip with students. It continued with my first encounter with John Dubé during a lecture Professor Heather Hughes, Professor Heather Hughes gave to our group just before a guided tour with Langa Dubé throughout Inanda and Otlangi. This is where I had stood 
with my little old camcorder in front of John Dubé's overgrown and not well tended grave, filming it. I asked myself then, and still continue to wonder, was that the moment when Dubé's spirit latched onto me, the accidental visitor to his grave, realizing that I was the connection needed to patch together his life and the lives of so many people that were so intimately tied to his own, his own life. The truth is that from that day of January 1999 to today, my life has been profoundly changed. Never a day has passed without me thinking about Dubé, Wilcox, Nokutela Dubé, Inanda, Cornfields, Temba Lithle, and the whole web of unsuspected connections that would have gone and noticed without my modest involvement in retrieving a piece. Yes, but an important piece in South Africa's complex liberation history. Let me recall another moment exactly 10 years ago in August, 2011, when I was invited, invited to give the JL Dube lecture at the kind request of professors Lebo Molesane and Simanga Kumalu. I chose for that lecture to focus on the two subjects of my second film in the trilogy, Reverend Wilcox and his wife and their work as the founders, not only as the people who brought John Dube to America, which was known, but their role as the founders of two communities, of the, of the, uh, of the founders of the, two, of the Zulu Industrial Improvement Company in 1911, and their work as the founders of two communities in the Natal Midlands with their Inanda partner, among 300 others, Reverend C.K. Goba of Inanda. Those informal settlements are known as cornfields and Tembalithle. The late professor, Reverend Bonganjalo Goba, may he rest in peace, was the respondent that day to both my film, Cemetery Stories, A Rebel Missionary in South Africa, and to my accompanying lecture. At the end of his remarks, Reverend Professor Goba said, he proclaimed, Professor Keita, the ancestors are not yet through with you. The ancestors are not yet through with you. In fact, what happened during that trip proved he was right. I had come to Durban that time to not only give this momentous lecture, but also to find Nukutela Dube's family once for all to begin to piece her life back together after she had fallen into total oblivion for some generations. How did I make this resolution? Once again, I must return to the spirits behind my house in Northfield. They provided me with the one irrefutable piece of evidence that a young Zulu girl named Nokutela had been their daughter Ira Bell's student at Inanda Seminary in the early 1880s. Ida Bell Wilcox, the Inanda Seminary teacher, had been an avid letter writer since her youth in Northfield. In keeping with her habit, she often wrote back to her mother and Clary in Northfield from various places in Natal, Inanda, Ifafa, Umtualumi, Amanzim Toti, etc. In one correspondence, she included the school essay of a very young girl named Nokutela to show her mother how Zulu girls were so intelligent and quick to learn English. This essay and the letter were published as was usually the case for her letters from South Africa in my town's newspaper, the Rice County Journal in 1882. At the end of a short essay, Nokutela wrote, and that essay was mentioned yesterday by Professor Hughes. Nokutela wrote, people who do not have children are troubled a lot. Think about it. Such a deep understanding of life coming from a, such a young girl. 
Was that not Nukutela speaking to me from the grave about her life as a woman who did not have a child of her own? And about the purgatory of history to which she had been condemned since her death in January 2017. Was that not Nukutela calling out to me to rescue her from erasure, the erasure to which biology had condemned her through no fault of her own? Clearly, once again, I was following the unmistakable guidance of some spirits, of several spirits active on both sides of the Atlantic. I could not but take my camera again, once again, to work on a third film, Ukukumbula Unukutela, Remembering Nukutela, completed in 2014, resulting in Nukutela being awarded the Gandhi Prize in 2013, along with her contemporary, Charlotte Manya Makeke, and to her receiving the Order of the Baba Award in Gold in 2017, exactly 100 years after her death. To start concluding the story of my two decades plus in the bush of spirits, let me revert back to Madiba. You remember that he was the one person who challenged me in 2000 when he admitted that he did not know much about Dube. Now I have another story about him from 2018 after he himself had passed on into the world of the spirits. You will understand through this story that he too was not yet through with me. In 2018, a senior researcher of the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory wrote to me to explain the following trail of connections from Madiba's recollections of his first trip to Mali in 1962. When Madiba arrived in Bamako, the capital city of Mali, as he was seeking the support of progressive African countries for the liberation struggle, he had first met a man named Lamin Keita, a high ranking official in the government. That Lamin Keita listened to my story and then introduced him to another man named Madera Keita. A lot of Keitas in this story. He was the Minister of Justice who in turn introduced Madiba to President Modibo Keita. The rest is history. Mali contributed generously and for the entire duration of the struggle to the upkeep of the ANC fighters in Tanzania and elsewhere. An action which garnered him, President Keita, I mean, the posthumous award of the Companions of Oa Tambo in 2006. This Mandela Foundation researcher wanted to find out if I knew that Lamin Keita and if he was a relative of mine. Are you ready for another revelation? Little did I know, after digging around, I discovered that he was indeed an adoptive cousin of my own father from the village of Joliba on the river Niger, where I spent my early childhood. I should note in passing that this is also the native village of singer Salif Keita. In African terms, Lamin Keita was a relative of mine. I had known about him when I was a very small boy, but did not know how much, I did not know much about his occupation beyond the fact that he was a very prominent man. He passed away a long time ago after I had left Mali for my studies in Europe. Thus, what was a long shot question from the Nelson Mandela Foundation led to my discovering suddenly an even earlier personal link to South Africa's history. Suddenly, I had seen the unlikely connection between my childhood village of Joliba and the journey across Africa of a man from Kuno, Nelson Mandela, who had embarked when I was a small boy in Mali on his long march to freedom for the people of South Africa. This journey he knew had started before him, before he was born. 
by John and Nkutela Dube, by William Wilcox and Northfield native Ida Bell Wilcox, and which required the sacrifices of so many anonymous people, people scattered around the globe. Let me now conclude, not as a filmmaker or historian, but as the professor of literature that I remain throughout, with a beautiful poem that sums up my journey in the bush of spirits, a journey my friend and brother, Dr. Zuelim Kize, as often called, a true case of ancestral possession. It is titled, Remember, some of you may, many of you may know the poem, and it is by the talented South African poet, Umaruddin Don Matera, who was born a Christian, converting to Islam later in his life, but who remained committed to the full spectrum of African spirituality. Remember, remember to call at my grave when freedom finally walks the land so that I may rise to tread familiar paths, to see broken chains, fallen prejudice, forgotten injury, pardoned pains. And when my eyes have filled their sight, do not run away from fright. If I crumble to dust again, it will only be the bliss of a long awaited dream that bids me rest when freedom finally walks the land. I cannot end without remembering one woman, Auntie Lulu Dube. One of the two children of Dube, I got to know, of Dube and Makumalu, I got to know, along with Uncle Sipo. She was an amazing lady with whom I felt from the first day I met her at her house in Otlange in 1999. I had felt a maternal connection. A woman of few words who told me this, Sharif, before you came, people did not know us. But since you came, everybody knows now who we are. This was to me the best reward for my labor for the spirits. I want to express also my most sincere gratitude to two important individuals without whom the Dube legacy would not be where it is today. My brother, Zenzele Dube, and Dr. Zuelim Kizi. First, Zay Dube. Zay is the man who traveled these two decades with me, empowering me to gather the pieces of his grandfather's story and tell it, not just because it is his family story, but because it is his country's story. It is Africa's story. It is America's story. And therefore, my story, and finally, because it's the beautiful story of one humanity through peoples of different colors fighting against injustice. I thank you, Zay. Yabonga Gakul. Now, my brother, Dr. Zulim Kizi, whose moral support, political savvy, enthusiasm, and personal wonderment about me the man he calls the Zulu man from Mali, carried Zay and myself throughout through this retrieval project. He asked me this question in 2006, when he first met Zay and me in his office, he was MEC of Economic Affairs at that time in Peter Marsburg in December, he said, Professor Keita, are you sure you are not a Sangoma? Are you sure you are not a Sangoma? This was a very perceptive question. One, it took me a long time to fully understand. He later said at the unveiling of the Nokutela Greystone, my brother, your research goes beyond academic. It is ancestral possession. Brother Mkise put his weight behind me and came to Los Angeles, California to deliver what he had promised to me in his office in 2006. He said, Professor Keta, when you are done with this research, what do you want us to do? I told him, Dr. Mkize, I want you, I want South Africa to send a delegation to come to California, to the, to the graves of these two humble missionaries 
who had labored so much, who had sacrificed so much for South Africa, but to whom nobody has said thanks. I want South Africa to come and express his gratitude. That day he said, I promise we are going to do it. So he came to give thanks to Reverend William and Adabel Wilcox. He later nominated them for the Distinguished Award of the Companions of Oa Tambo, which they received in 2009, the very morning they were being honored in Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Kabazela. You are the, a man of great vision. Finally, I want to thank the dynamic teams of UKZN and you all today for the opportunity to address you on the 150th anniversary of Dr. John Langalibali Dube, U Mafuguzela on Jengezulu, Mafuguzela We Africa, the humble leader who worked tirelessly for a day when the children of Africa will walk with their heads held high, enjoying total control of their own destiny on the land of their ancestors. May his example of community service continue to inspire us all to invest our better selves in the buildings of just and peace-loving nations across Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much, Professor Keita. What a remarkable, remarkable storyteller. A man with the camera in the bush of spirits. A man who tells legacies. A Pan-African historian with a memory of great elephants. So remarkable. Thank you for sharing your research, for sharing your scholarship, for sharing your insights, really. And I just want to remind everyone that you are welcome to record your questions and your comments at the, you'll see the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen so that we can continue to, to engage. I now want to welcome a respondent to Professor Keita's talk, Professor Smangaliso Kumalo, who is an associate professor of public theology um, at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And he's also, among others, the director for the Center for Constructive Theology and uh, an academic leader of the Theology and Ethics Cluster in the School of Religion, Philosophy, and Classics. I will not read. Um, the rest of, of, of the bio. Professor Kumalo, before I say over to you, I just want to have something that is, that is ringing in my head. Freedom will walk the land. Mm. And this, this mm. is the legacy of Ndadeje Dube. Freedom will walk the land. We will continue to do this work through film, through poetry, through academia, through practical solidarity, through the politics and spirits of our ancestors. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And over to you, Professor Kumalo. Mm. Good afternoon uh, to the DVC. Uh, Professor Mkise, uh, to the program director, uh, who is amazing in her own right, um, to my brother, Sharif Keita, salam alaikum, my brother. It's good to, 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 to be with you. To the deans, uh, Professor um, CB and Professor David Spurret of the two schools um, that are responsible for this lecture to my colleagues, uh, to Mamumbete, uh, to Usis Zodwa, Usis Telela, Usis Doreen, and many, many others, Professor uh, King Costa, and to see Professor John 
Komarov in our midst also uh, is really an honor. We are so excited uh, to have you in this lecture. Now, my colleagues in, a, in the preparation team, I have always believed that they, 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 they love me. Uh, they have the best uh, at heart for me. But today I really realize that they don't really love me. Who, what person would put you to speak after Sheriff Keita if they love you? <laughs> because <laughs> Sheriff Keita uh, just <laughs> takes the whole, um, the whole enthusiasm. He's got wisdom, he's got experience and all that. But I've always marveled at listening uh, to Professor Keita. It's, it's always an honor. Friends, it's just um, a few slides that I want to go through as a way of responding uh, to Professor Keita's uh, uh, address and lecture. Many people, uh, before we, 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 we could talk about Dube, would always wonder, what's the fuss about this John Dube? Who is this John Dube anyway? What is there to talk about a man who was born 150 years ago and died far back in 1946? Um, that people in 2003 and onwards could actually spend their lives doing research and trying to understand and uplift this man. And I think Professor Keita has put it quite well uh, today by saying, maybe most of us who are involved with this work are actually possessed by some spirit. Because indeed, it's a work of passion. In this whole university, I know of no lecture that has been uh, hosted from one year to another consistently without fail and without any strong budget um, every year for 18 years, as this one has. And if you look at the team that hosts this lecture, it's just a, a small team of about six people who meet every year to reflect on this. And it is this lecture that in this university that is over a century old, it was only in this lecture that a university lecture was hosted using the Zulu language fully from beginning to end. Um, it, was, um, it was for the first time that something like this could be done. And it was well celebrated by people in the university community. So indeed, there are some spirits that are pushing people to be involved in different ways to keep this legacy alive. Now, I always have this picture of Mandela on the 27th of April, 1994, um, flying first thing in the morning from Johannesburg, his home, flying to KwaZulu Natal, to, to Oshange, John Dube's uh, uh, school and place. And he went to vote there that day. That's where M Mandela voted. And in fact, this is him voting. And after voting, it is said that he walked uh, on a very pensive mood and walked the, the meters, about 500 meters from the voting hall where he voted to the Dube Cemetery, uh, where Dube uh, and him, the members of the family uh, lie buried there. And he moved in, into, zoomed in into these graves. And then he said these very penetrative words, Mr. President, I am here to report that today South Africa is free. And that day Mandela connected with Dube and reported to him the transition that had just been made by South Africa. But who was this Dube? What shaped Dube? 
What made this African great leader born in about 8 February 11, 1871? What made this African to emerge as an amazing leader with very limited opportunities and resources? For me, I always think that there are three pillars that shaped Dube's life. Firstly, of course, it was a Zulu culture and the socialization that he had from uh, his upbringing uh, from amongst his people. More especially the influence of um, his mother, Elizabeth Mashangase, because his father died just three years after Dube had been born. He was born in 1971 and the father died in 19, in, sorry, in 1871 and the father died in 1874. So he was very much influenced and shaped by his mother who gave him the culture, who made him, educated him and brought him up. But growing up in a mission station, in Nanda mission station, a mission station of the, the American board of foreign missionaries, people who were known that they belonged to the tradition of nonconformists, people who worked for freedom, who believed deeply in the freedom of human beings. And so that shaped his thinking uh, and his upbringing and his outlook uh, on life. But over and above that, was shaped by the mission station education that he, he got, uh, both from Inanda and also from um, uh, Amazon Dodd at Adams College. These are the resources that made Dube. But more than that, Dube, as the DVC shared with us about this new book that is coming out, unfortunately, we have to, uh, it, we only have the sample copy at the moment, um, the, the, the publishers are still working on the book. They were hoping it would be out today, but it is not out yet, but it's coming out quite soon. Uh, the book uh, titled John Nogutela and Angelina Dube, Pioneers of Education for Self-Reliance, Komali Paretali Religion and Democratic Politics in South Africa. He was shaped very much by the women around him the women that he grew uh, with, with and also was part of. Yes, as I've mentioned, his mother, uh, Uma Shangase. But then the two amazing women who came in his life, first Unogutela, Mdima, whom he married in 1894 um, and until their separation in, in, in 1914, and subsequently her death in 1917. A woman who by the time he married, she already was qualified as a teacher. In fact, at the time, Dube himself had no tangible qualification. He had gone to the US and came back without really successfully acquiring a, 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 an education that is certificated. And very much marrying this powerful emerging woman um, gave gravitas to his passion, his work, his call to the ministry. And she journeyed with him all his life. And also in 1920, when he married um, Angelina Umakumal, again a person who was also a leader in her own right, who also played a role uh, to influence and shape Dube. Now, the, the relationship between Dube and his wife, here we're talking about a Zulu man born in about 1871, when Zulu men were very, very much patriarchal at the time. We see a man who, wasn't, who, who was pushing the boundaries of patriarchy in his own way. Who can imagine of a man at that time, of a Zulu man at that time, before the 1900s, taking, when he gets a scholarship to go overseas to study, instead of leaving the wife to look after the home and the parents takes his wife with him, goes with her to New York, uh, Brooklyn to study. And when he gets there, 
doesn't leave her behind, but walks with her from one church to another, from one conference to another, from one uh, speaking engagement to another, where she has got her own role alongside him together they are addressing crowds. They are singing for crowds. They are collecting money that they are going to come back with to build Oshange. You see a, a new type of marriage and relationship between these two uh, African Zulu people. They are working together. They are supporting one another. And indeed, they are seen when they are, they are building Oshange, uh, when they came back for the, they, they became became pastors in this church that you see here in Nanda, um, Congregational Church. And then after that, they moved to Oshlange to establish the school. They do it together. And then after that, they write that Zulu songbook uh, together. They started Dilangala Senatali together. They are doing things together and they are supporting and helping each other uh, in this process. And even when uh, Noctella had died, and then Angelina, Angelina had come into the picture. Again, in 1921, Dubek gets an invitation from W.E. Du Bois uh, to that great meeting of Pan-Africanism in London, meeting at Central Hall uh, in London at Westminster. And when he gets there, he goes with uh, Angelina, doesn't say be left behind and look after the kids or whatever goes with Angelina to this meeting. And in this meeting, Angelina participated. She was introduced to W.E. Du Bois. And a leader is being made so that she becomes a leader in her own right through her husband, who is also going to benefit in many ways uh, from, uh, from her contribution. As you can see here, Dubé died in 1946, just after 26 years of marriage with Angelina. And she's left behind. And, and her contribution, we spoke about that yesterday. Um, yes, her contribution, she had children with him. They had six children, two of them died. She raises them um, all by herself. And over and above that, she was influential in making sure that Oshang as a school continues. As you can see in this photo, she is with the board of Oshange. You can see Esting over there, the most famous uh, principal of Oshange. You can also see Reverend Izet Skakane, who was uh, in the board as a chairperson and many others who are there. In her old age, she saw and made sure that Oshange continues until her death in around 1986. 40 years all by herself, holding up the legacy of John Dube to keep it alive. It's a contribution where Dube contributed in the making of his partners into leadership, but they also contributed in making him the man and leader that he became. Now, there are just few points that I want to highlight as Dubé's contribution uh, to South Africa uh, today from those early years of pioneering African politics um, and how those uh, few points are becoming much more relevant for us today. For instance, it was Dubé uh, who had a very clear understanding that politics um, is a religion and religion is political. That's why he didn't see this idea of dichotomizing a religion from politics or what is sacred from what is secular. He held these together and pioneered. That's why in, one, in my first book on uh, John Dube, I titled it Pastor and Politician, trying to say that Dube pioneered that fine line, that fine path of holding together a liberatory religion together with politics so that we do not justify the, 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 the tendency of people that once they are religious, they leave politics on its own and don't influence it positively. And also for politicians, 
to always think that religion has no place in politics, especially in the African context where people generally are religious in their thinking. You need these uh, to, to hold and support and be synergized for the full uh, liberation of people. Next point, Dube had this idea that he took from Bukati uh, Washington uh, of Tuskegee, that education must be built on three um, uh, principles, which he called them the three edges. The first edge is that it must be education um, for, for the head, meaning that the mind must comprehend and understand. And then the second edge is education for the heart. Um, education must lead to some conviction to the real truths of life. Uh, lastly, the, the, the third edge is education must be for the hand, which is the hand must be taught to create, to build, to develop, so that people can learn to do things for themselves. They can learn self-reliance once they are educated, which talks, says a lot to the kind of education that we have in the country in South Africa, where we may have so many people that graduate with degrees and all that and education that we give to them, but they remain poor, marginalized and unemployed because the kind of education that we gave to them did not empower them to do things for themselves but it always empowered them to go around looking for opportunities created by others. Dube would question that type of education if we are offering it. Dube also spoke about a form of Africanism in a context where people were not thinking anything that is good that can be if you're an African. At the time of, or at his time, people were always thinking, ah, it's always better to be white because you've got privileges, you've got the language, you've got education, you've got resources and all that. Dube started amongst, you can say he's a founder in the South African context of African consciousness or, or pan-Africanism. He's not the only one, but he's one of the pioneers. For somebody like him in the early 1900s to be saying things like, at the outset, let me say that I am proud of my people, proud of being a full-blooded African myself. Hear him say that just as we are coming to see that our future in this country is dependent upon our growth into a united nation, so too the Bantu are beginning dimly to desire the same truth with regard to them. Christianity and education have done so something towards breaking down the old tribal isolation, which for centuries existed between the Zulu and the Tosa, between the Basutu and the Bachwana. People are becoming Africans. What matters is being an African, not our tribal roots. That's what Dube began to conscientize people with. One of the other issues that he raised is the issue about land, which it is still an issue even today. So if you look at the issue of um, Pan-Africanism, where he's embracing all Africans, I wonder if Dube would actually, what would we say today when he looks at us and look at how much we've become so tribalistic in a way and how we, we click with, one, with our own in our own regional ethnic, ethnic backgrounds and all those sorts of issues. He may challenge us out of that and say what it matters is that we are Africans. And in terms of land, he was very involved with land. Dube is amongst the, the first Africans to organize African people to contribute cattle to buy land so that they could own land themselves. The company that Professor Keita was talking about was there so that it can enable black people to put together, pull together their resources so that they could buy land and own land. And as he once said, we have seen our people driven from the places dear to them as the inheritance of generations to become wanderers on the face of the earth. That was in a protest as he was talking to the missionaries whom he accused of owning land and making black people rent 
in, in building and staying in those mission stations and arguing that that was not appropriate, they shouldn't be doing it. Another perspective that Dube threw into the struggle, he was very much committed to a nonviolent um, approach as an approach on appropriate method of resistance. And people needed to fight for their rights. They needed to walk towards their liberation and freedom. But he believed that they shouldn't be using violence in that. Already the Zulu is throwing away his Asekai so that he may speed the plow and help the earth to bring forth her increase. If you go on with that quotation there, he talks about how violence actually disadvantages or kills almost everybody who is involved. In a context of violence, there is no winner, but there are bad winners and bad losers in a violence. The solution is to avoid violence. Lastly, Dube spoke about leadership um, and a leadership that is serving to people, a leadership that is not there to empower oneself, but there to serve people. He says, it has been my lot in life and I trust it will be so long as I live to further the cause of my people, to labor for their enlightenment and advancement, both in temporal and spiritual matters. I live to serve them, however poor my service may be and however disheartening at times the work may be. And he knew what he was talking about by saying it sometimes it is heartening. You would remember how he was, he, he had to leave uh, the leadership of the ANC, which was not a peaceful transition. It was a very painful experience for him to be, how many times he was arrested and beaten here in, in, in Durban by the leadership at the time. How many times the missionaries of his own church castigated him and blaming him for being an Ethiopian um, in, his, in, his, in his approach and thinking because he's, he's fighting for his people. How many times his own people, just the name Mafuguzela, it wasn't a given to him as a fond name that was meant to celebrate him. In fact, talking to Usis Lulu Dube uh, in one of my interviews with her, she says people actually were using that name uh, to spite Dube, saying, what is Dube trying to do and toiling, thinking he can build a school? Can a black person build a school? And indeed, he built the school. Now, this is the kind of leadership that I think South Africa needs today to hear. At a time when we've got so many, many resources around us, to uplift our people. There is so much money, there is technology, there is the internet, there are resources, there is education and all that all around us. But in times of our leadership, sometimes we find ourselves that our leadership styles leave a lot to be desired in this country. As one can actually see that those who've been entrusted with leadership have led us in a process where more has been lost from the people than what they have given in leadership. As a result, we've had these um, commissions of inquiries now and again, which is questioning our quality of leadership that we've provided in the country. May we learn to live according to John Dubin. He may have been born 170, uh, 150 years ago, but even today, his teaching on leadership, on education, on land, on, polit on politics still stands. May we learn and pick a pattern for ourselves. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Keita. Indeed, may we learn and pick this pattern for ourselves. Such words, of encouragement, such thought-provoking questions and comments, possibilities, new ideas to flourish that Professor Kumalo has put on the table. So many scenarios that extend um, the legacy 
of Udaduje El Dube. I am aware that there are questions. This is the time that we can all engage in conversation, asking questions, commenting. I'm seeing three questions at the moment, and I'm not sure if Professor Keita and Professor Kumalo are able to see these questions or if I should read them out. I don't want to be redundant. Should I read them out? Yeah, read them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So a question, a question from Nombomelelo Tabete. This uh Utim, oh no, I'm so sorry. This is Mr. S. A. Numalo, current Oshange principal. Uti. It is Will you please undeniable. read them. Yes, I am. I'm reading. Uti Umiste Numalo. It is undeniable that Dr. JL Dube is a giant among men. What stops us from collecting all his works from around the world and create a monument that resembles a Mandela capture site in Hoek? That's the first leg of the question. Furthermore, can Oslange have an exchange program with the US where we can follow on the footsteps of JL so that we can have more Dr. Dubis today from Oslange in the fields of politics, religion, anthropology, media, agriculture. So that's the first question. And as you marinate on that, I'll read the next two questions so that we can tackle all these three. Um, so, so you've got that first, that first question. Um, okay, got it. And now the second question goes directly to Professor Keita from Dr. Giring Mutwahai. Professor Keita, we have been voted, we, are, we have voted, we are free. COVID-19 has proved to us that South Africa still has a long way to become one nation. Poverty is glaring, our leaders are trapped in corruption. I'm sure Dr. JL Dube and Madiba are turning in their graves as greed ravages our country. This is not what they fought for. How do we heal our country? And I think um, Professor Keita can, can um, start with, with that question perhaps. Um, then I'll read the third question before I, I give over to the speakers. Mujalifa Makhata says, is it possible that Mrs. Dube Senior Unobutela played a significant role in shaping the worldview of her husband, giving a level of education at the time and her husband's desire to have her by her to have her by his side all the time. She must have played a significant role in his life. If women had to know their place in society under patriarchy, we must ask the question, what role was she playing in her husband's life for him to have seen her as something greater than a bearer of children? So those are the first three questions. Um, can we start with uh, Mr. Numalo's uh, uh, question from Oshange? Okay, would Professor Kumalo like to answer the first one because uh, I believe that this is uh, some of the things we should be working on yes. as Mr. Kumalo has suggested yes. for the future you know uh, these are things that can be developed mm. you know uh, institutions that can be developed uh, mm. where we can teach the history the story of JL Dube and all those leaders that he, he influenced mm. so uh, and I understand that uh, at the Howick uh, uh, Mandela capture area in fact uh, somebody had contacted me to tell me that they were going to include Nokutela's story there, which I, you know, uh, really applauded. So I hope that these are local initiatives that you all can drive, you see. And I'm sure UKZN can take a, a, and, and the JL Dube Institute with mm -hmm. Sister Tandin Nobo. You, can, you all can make this happen. Mm -hmm. So the Departments of Education, both at the uh, provincial level and national level, can work on redeveloping a, a scholarship uh, program. 
you know, to take ex ex uh, outstanding students on a kind of off-campus tour, just like I did taking my students to South Africa to study issues of identity. This was such a eye opening thing. This is the, the, the experience that changed my life. I mean, really, as a as the teacher, I mean, my life was so profoundly changed with that travel program. So, let alone my students, who are now working in different fields. You see, so I believe that something should be happening. You know, on the in the other direction, coming here, and I'll be very happy to take those students on the road to show them. I'll bring them here to Northfield, Minnesota. In fact, when I brought. Ila Gandhi, the Honorable Ila Gandhi, to Northfield in 2013 and took her to the great, to the cemetery behind my house, my old house at that time. I took her to the cemetery. She was blown away because she had not known that a piece of South Africa's history was lying right there in Minnesota. That's why she was so blown away that when she returned to, to South Africa, two weeks later, she decided that, Sharif, this year, Nokutela has to be the, the recipient of the Gandhi Award. The first award anybody ever gave to Nokutela was given by the Gandhi Foundation. Mm. And as a result of the Honorable Ila Gandhi's discovering of places that mattered in South Africa's history. So I agree very much with the, uh, uh, the question, uh, the, the, the person who asked the question uh, uh, here, Mr. Mkumalo, you see? So, this is something. This is something we have to develop. Second answer. Second thing. You see, yes, Madiba and Dube are turning their graves because this is not what they work for. I just want to give you a little example. You know, the house that is the building that is today, the JL Dube Interpretive Center. You all know that this was John and Nukutela's first house, and I think Angeline also lived there very briefly. Now. Do you know that people had to fight to convince Dube that he deserved a better house in 1922, that he deserved a better house than the one he was living in because the students he had trained at Otlange to be self-sustaining, those young people were now living in better houses than he himself, the principal. People had to beg Dube to build a, 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 a better house. And in fact, to convince him, to push him to do it, they started a fundraiser. And you know who put the first pound there? It was William Wilcox. He says, I'm putting the first pound. Whoever is, made the devil take anybody who is against this idea. William Wilcox put the first pound towards building the present house that Dube is living in. So that's an example of how Dube did not work for him. I mean, he didn't amass this money for himself. Everything he owned, he put into Otlange. This is different from today's leaders. They have a lesson to take from John Dube. And this story of people begging him that he needs to live in a better house, that, no, be serious, be, live in a better house because the students you train today are living in better houses. Because in those days, it was maybe wattle and dog. Simply, you see. So now I think the first, uh, you know, the third one about Nokutela's role. Yes, you see, Nokutela and John, they modeled their lives very much on the life of William and Ida Bell, who were almost like their parents. You see, I've been learning more about Ida Bell, this woman, thanks to whose writings we've been getting all these things. See, this lady was from a very a young age, a very wise woman. You see, Wilcox was very impetuous. He was too hot-blooded. And I've come across moments where Wilcox himself said, you know, John and I, we were planning to do certain things right away, but Ida Bell told us, no, 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 this is not the time. Calm down, gentlemen. You don't want to turn people against you too soon. So I believe that Nukutela also modeled really her life. She was a very wise young woman, you've, you've known that from her early writing. When she tried in her first writing, she said, my home Africa, there are good people, there are bad people. Nokutela was trying to, what was saying, we are like human beings, we are human beings. We are like everybody. We are good, we are bad. 
So don't think that because we are black, we are different. No, this young girl at 11 years of age was also teaching to the world that we are human beings. You see, and then she had this wisdom of life. So I think she didn't want to push herself, you know, to the front. And she always took this role, but she was the force behind John. And you are right, Brother Kumalo, that Mark, uh, Brother uh, Kumalo, yes, that Mark Kumalo, <laughs> you see, was also the strength. Although she was 20 years or something younger than, than her husband, but she was a very wise woman. And the, in the way she lived, in the way she kept this heritage, this legacy together, in the way she surrounded herself with people who could carry the work. I mean, again, I hope I've answered that third question. Thank you so much for the question. So maybe Brother Kumalo would like to add. Yeah, just briefly, um, <coughs> uh, just to say, I agree um, with Ms. Uzui de la Pana to say there is need for us to embark uh, on collecting uh, Dube's uh, history um, from all over the world. Um, I think that's important. We need to work together. Um, our, our school would be very happy to do that, uh, to work with, uh, with Oshlange Institute, uh, the school uh, in, 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 in connecting. We've done some work before. Uh, I've been there a few times, I've brought in visitors and all that, but we need to take that and concretize it. Ubaba Ulanga Dube is here, uh, the grandson uh, of um, uh, Ubaba Dube. He always talk about this every year during the lecture. He says, why are we not taking this story to the schools, to the children? And we've got partnerships in our school. My dean is here, uh, can attest to that. A number of partnerships with international schools, especially in the US, one of the things that maybe we need to start exploring when we are working on these partnerships is a school and an institution there like Oberlin. If we can form a partnership with Oberlin where Dube went and studied um, and, and even Tuskegee because it is still there and quite strong mm -hmm. and see if we can form these partnerships and we can have exchanges. The fact that Noctela was, uh, was groundbreaking in her feminism and, and consciousness as a woman, is, can, nobody can doubt that. And it, she formed Jube in her own way. And you are right, we need to do more detailed work. We need to be encouraging young uh, black women and black girls to study Nogutela up to PhD level to discover what nurtured this woman to become the kind of pioneer of African women consciousness and liberation. Thank you. Let me quickly um, add something. Add to that. Let me quickly add something. And my wish is that for 2023, that's the year when Nukutela was born. Mm. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the 150th anniversary of Nukutela's birth. Mm. I, I pray that something similar is done for her. Mm. Mm. Something similar is done for her. And I also want to echo an idea that Dr. Cheryl Potgitter, the former yes. DVC, yes. A, a, a said a, a few years ago that Nokutela, Mama Nokutela Ndima Dube be given a doctorate honoris causa posthumously, mm. hopefully at that occasion. Mm. That's my prayer. Okay. That's my prayer. Mm. Thank you. Yes, may that may that prayer be answered, Professor Kete. I wanted to add to what Professor Kumalo was answering that question uh, with another question from Pumelelo uh, Pungula, who says, "Would um, would you, Professor uh, Kumalo, um, describe Dr. J. L. Dube as a feminist, taking into consideration his efforts to fight?" patriarchal thinking as highlighted in, in Professor Keita's, um, or in your presentation, actually, yes. uh, um, you know, is, is he a feminist? Is he an ally? Is yeah. he a challenger <laughs> of patriarchal thinking? Uh, where do we place him? Well, uh, very interesting, um, uh, Natalia, that uh, this question is asked. When he started the school, um, in those days, 
most schools were for boys and mm-hmm. parents were reluctant uh, to send girls to school. And Dube intentionally built dormitories and created spaces for girls. And he argued even when they were there because children, the, the students themselves had to cook, they had to do domestic work and all that. He said, all of them, there are no gender roles here. Both boys and girls are going to cook. Just imagine in 1900, a Zulu man pushing for girls to be educated at that time, pushing for boys to cook and collect water and clean the house, collect cow dung to clean the classrooms, you know, and just like that, work that is relegated to, to women and to girls. And Dube wrote it down and said, this is one school where there will be no gender roles. They will all learn to do all the roles that are important for anybody to make a contribution in bettering their own lives and the lives of others in society. That was confronting directly the patriarchal stereotypes as far as gender roles were concerned. So I would be one of those people who would say, oh yes, uh, even though for some people they think that feminism is just for women, but Dube here is actually teaching most of us that we better do it well, that we become feminist um, yeah, and, and support the liberation of girls and, and women, as Dube did in 1900 already. Thank you. And Professor Kumalo, let me add this to, this, to your answer. Dube, in fact, you know that Oberlin College, mm where Dube, in fact, he started, Dube finished his high school education in Oberlin before yes. going on to the college. Yes. You know that Oberlin College was the first university in the United States to admit both girls and boys. The first university. And it was also the first university to admit black, the descendants of slaves. Mm -hmm. The school was founded. So you can imagine where Dube got these ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I went to a school uh, that fought for women to be admitted as equal learners, then how can I create a school in Africa Mm -hmm. that will exclude women? Mm -hmm. So we have to go back to that history, to the Dube's antecedents as a learner. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, I think think, think these responses allude and, and, and try to answer another one of Bumalelo's questions that, um, you know, with the current challenges with gender-based violence, how do we use his colossal figure to fight the, the scourge of, of GBV? Do you want to add uh, something to, to that? Because I think you've, you've given such context to a man in a 1900 who is, is, is letting, uh, 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 who's allowing girls and boys to be, mm-hmm. you know, responsible yeah. and not to assign gender to, to the roles yeah. that they take. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, Natalia, um, Do- Dube teaches us that gender stereotypes are taught, they are socialized, they are given to us. It's poison that is given to us as men to drink and enjoy and then live according to that. But if we are told something different to relate differently to women, we can behave in a different manner towards women just as Dube did in that. And so that's what I learned. It still blows my mind away what African Zulu men in 1900 and early in all those years get a scholarship and a trip to America, picks, goes with his wife for three months, takes the wife away, close the house, goes with the wife to be there as they are attending meetings and all that, comes back again to even introduce them, to introduce your wife to W.E. Du Bois. Who doesn't want to be introduced to, to Du Bois? And it creates these opportunities because he believes 
that this wife is capable of comprehending the significance of these pan-Africanism events that is attending and understanding and engaging and interlocuting with these high people and great minds of the world. Dube didn't doubt his wives. I think that is important to enable Noctela to meet with Booker T. Washington, introduce uh, her to him and then have conversations and all that. Wow, that's powerful. If we can learn that today, we will all be walking around with our wives, no matter what conference or meetings that we are, there will be no meetings that are dominated by men because men will bring along their wives. We need to teach Dube more to our boys. Because their wives are scholars. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because, can because I add, their can wives I add? are scholars and researchers yes. in, in their can own Can I life. add just uh, <laughs> one little piece here? Can I add just one, one word here? Can I add just one word? Yes. Go how, ahead, much, Prof. how much is gender-based violence connected to economic hardship and economic issues? Yes. And Brother Kumalo said that, you see, Dube school was school for independence, was for self-reliance, yes. school where people don't have to go look for jobs. They can employ themselves. Imagine if we reimagine the educational system to train our youth, men and women, to be able to take care of themselves, to be able to employ themselves. How many how much the squabbles in the families about the meager resources would be reduced because both the husband and the wife would be breadwinners, would be able to stand on their feet, would be able to jointly take care of the kids, would be able to respect each other. So how much of that is tied to the education we are failing to give to our children? Africa, modern Africa, 21st century, 20th century, 21st century, failed to find the proper educational mode for our kids. Some of the issues that the generation of Dube were try had already successfully solved. I mean, if you go over at the publications of, the, of Otlangi in the 1930s, the, the students who are graduated in the school book, they could write poems in Zulu, eloquent poems, but they had graduated with degrees in carpentry. They were people who had had an all round, all rounded education. Mm. who could work with their head, who could work with their heart, who could work with their hands. Mm. How much would that yeah. reduce gender-based violence? Let's think about that. Very thought-provoking, Prof, and how this conversation has actually raised the curiosity around the, the interrelatedness um, of our challenges, of our problems, that they, they don't just sit one problem does not just sit on its own. It generates and it's generated by other issues. Umonde Masiana says, do we want to Tuskegee do? The same Tuskegee of Tuskegee MN. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I'm reading it in his tone. That's the tone. Yeah. Do we want yeah. to Tuskegee yeah. too? <laughs> yes. There you go, Monde. That's your answer. He did. He did. And he. Of course, <laughs> of course, he, he, he visited. Let, yeah, he, he, visited. He, visited. Let, let, he visited. Yeah, in fact, let me tell you another anecdote. When Wilcox was given John Dube as a 16 year old boy to take to America, Wilcox had no money really. But Dube's mom had brought a little bag with 30 gold sovereigns and given it to Wilcox, Baba. Please, this son, this boy is your son. His father passed on. This is the share of the money he left for his son's education. Please take this and take it with you. Take it, take him with you. He's your son. Wilcox looked at this money. The mother thought that this was a lot of money, but actually, this was just enough to pay for Dubé's boat passage. Now, Wilcox, when he said, Yes, I'm going to take him, he had a big problem now on his hands. How am I going to get this boy educated? Now I've decided that I'm going to take it with me, take him with me. So first of all, he said, he said this, okay, I'm going to take him on two conditions. He told the mom, you promise that 
when your son goes to America, he's not expecting to have a free ride that somebody's going to take care of him. The mom said, yes, I promise. He asked Dubé, John, will you promise that when I take you, to, take you to America, you are going to work just like me. I'd worked for my own education to pay for my own education. Are you promising that you are going to do the same and not expecting a free ride? John said, yes. Then he said, okay, I'm going to take you. Now, when they traveled to America, they got there. Now he had to figure out how to get him educated now. He had made arrangement with a school called the Hampton Institute where Booker T. Washington had studied himself during the, uh, 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 the days of slavery. When he, Booker T. Washington, had studied at the Hampton Institute, it was a school created to teach uh, uh, blacks the manual education. It was created by, by whites. Okay, now, Wilcox had made arrangements for Dubé to have a, a, a scholarship there. So when he took John with him to the school, John looks around and he only finds black kids and Native American kids. John looks around, he said, he, tell, he turned to Wilcox and said, Baba, I don't wanna go to this school. I want to mm. go to the school you went to. Literally as a white man, I want to go to your school because my mom sent me to America. She said, he said she, she told you, Baba, I want you to take my son to America so that he can get education that only white kids get in South Africa. Mm. So in other words, I want education that white kids get too. So now you are taking me to a school for blacks and Indians in America. You see how mm. John Dupe challenges systems. Mm. He says, no, I don't wanna to go to the school. I want to go to your school. Now Wilcox says, okay, good, now, good. You can go there, but you remember your, your promise. You promise that you're going to work just like me to pay for my education. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you to that school because he knew that Oberlin took black students, but the condition was that John accept to take any kind of job so he could pay for his education. It, that's how it took him to, 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 to Oberlin, which was a white college. So really, Dube did not go to Tuskegee, which was a school for black kids, black mm -hmm. students. No, he didn't go there. But he always remembered that model. Mm -hmm. He always had respect for mm -hmm. that model of Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. So he visited Tuskegee many times. Monday, this is the story. <laughs> he had regards for, for Tuskegee and the model. Mm -hmm. In fact, Otlange came to be known as the Tuskegee of Africa. Um, I see Umonga is very thankful of, of, um, of that answer. And Oshange is, to me, the Oshange of Oshange, a pan-African space that is yes. just renowned, um, which, which I would put on par yeah. with, with, with Tuskegee. And just to, to, echo, to echo that, uh, Mdudu asks, do you have um, hope that this knowledge one day will be passed to our young kids at school? If you do, what strategy would you have for, for the Department of Education to, to, to accept this? And this makes me think really of, of, of Professor Muletzane's work um, in rural education. Some of the the contribution that she, she makes um, with her researchers, the people that she teaches to teach in these spaces. And I'm just wondering if, if, if Professor Mletzane wants to, to, to add to, um, to responding to, um, to, to Dudu Zingubane's question, because I do believe that this education is being passed in to, 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 to young kids. However, we always have a sense of how we legitimize knowledge that is it in the academy, is it registered with you know, the Department of Education? And if not, is it legitimate enough? So, so that's just my, 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 my thinking on that. Uh, Professor Mletzani, am I, am I bothering you if I, if I ask you to just say a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, you are bothering me, but it is a question. <laughs> but it is a question that I am passionately interested in. And there isn't a straightforward answer really to that. The short answer is um, uh, the kids today are really not getting that, um, that, that um, kind of education on any large scale. What we do is little uh, pockets of uh, programming in rural schools and in rural communities for a few kids. And what we require is a large scale um, applications of some of the models which we have tested and which we know work. But try telling our uh, Department of Basic Education that. Try telling our uh, Department of Higher Education and innovation that um, for more funding so that we can um, um, uh, upscale or um, implement those uh, programs on a large scale. Was that the, the, the answer you were looking for? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, um... so in short, yeah. Mm. Okay, I'm done. No, Thanks. go ahead, go ahead in yeah. short. So in short, there are pockets of really good programs that have been tested, not only at UKZN. I know that Rhodes University have also, has, have also tested some really uh, wonderful programs. Uh, Nelson Mandela University is also pioneering in some of the areas in the Eastern Cape. And so what we need now is to put those pockets of small projects together and uh, implement them on a large scale. I actually agree. I think, you know, those, what you call small pockets, I don't know if I agree that they're small, they're large contributors and perhaps leading up to, to, to the lecture um, could be those kinds of sessions where um, scholars and practitioners are actually speaking to one another about the progress that is being made, the challenges that are being faced, and what, what, is, what is needed in terms of resources. At least sometimes you don't get the resources, but if you know what those resources are, I think that's an upscale on its own. Um, thank, okay, you. Yeah. thank you, Prof. Melesani. Sipoma Gwaza asks, where is selflessness? the selflessness that was advocated by Dube in today's leaders. Yep. I don't know if you can answer that one, Professor Kumalo. You wanna chat? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a question that we are all asking. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, maybe the answer lies in holding uh, it into a creative synergy uh, as when we raise uh, people uh, to appreciate their culture uh, because there are, th th there are teachings in our cultures that help us to be ethical um, human beings um, and hold that in creative tension with the Western form of education that we have. Um, and also bring a religion to the picture um, no matter what it is, African spirituality, which is open to all sorts of interpretations of the existence of the transcendent being that influences reality for the, for the best for all people. That kind of belief and philosophy to be built on the one individual for human beings are not just uh, uh, scientific human beings. They are also spiritual, they are also cultural, they are also religious, they are also biological. It's, it, human beings are a combination of different factors. So we need to be nurturing and building uh, human beings who are going to be leaders in making sure that they are well-rounded in terms of the education that we give to them. Thank you. I agree. And this conversation, this engagement is really life-giving. And the kind of things that you're mentioning says, we don't just look at government and yeah. you know, the, the blame culture 
um, mm. to, to government. That, not that we're vindicating our governments, but the blame culture that we put on, mm. on government or even the, acad the, the academy, then mm. we tend to just sit and fold our arms, but mm. we all have a stake yes. and, and a role to play, big, big shoes to, mm. to, to fill um, indeed. Mm -hmm. um, this conversation is dangerous in many ways because by the time I look at, at my clock, it will be 8 p.m. <laughs> and we're just going, going, going. So I want to see if there is one or two last comments um, or questions that, that we can take for, for our, our, our panelists. And if not, let me see, I'm going to count three going once, two, going, twice. Okay, it looks like we are going to have the last words from Prof. Keta and Prof. Pumalo uh, before we um, get to, to, to um, allow Mr. Langa Dube to give us a message from the Dube family. Any last words from, from the two of you who have given us such an enlightening and enriching, truly, truly, I'm not just saying it. It is, I'm sure that the people who are in this audience are provoked, are fed, both spiritually and, and mentally. Thank you to both of you. Um, thank you. Well, I just want to say, Thank you, thank you for the opportunity that uh, the spirits have given me to walk on their footsteps, to become truly an African. I am from West Africa, but I'm from Mali, but South Africa today has become my home. Mm -hmm. And there's something on the land of South Africa. Once my feet touch it, I mean, something happens in me. You know, in fact, I mean, people, tell me oh whenever you are here we want you to always come back because when you are here the week you spend or the two weeks you spend we all feel so energized and then you, you disappear again so we want you to come back so i feel that this is so humbling it's so honoring to me that my scholarship you know can be of use to people across the continent because that's what i told my father my late father who was in fact one of the spirits behind me, but time didn't allow me to mention that. Mm. That beyond all those spirits was the spirit of my own father who just passed on a month after I had discovered John Duby, my father had passed on. And my father had never been to school. My father who put me to school, thanks to whom today I am a professor at one of the best institutions in the world. My father had never been to school. He had never had formal education, but he learned to read and write in the French army as he was fighting to defend France from Nazism. My father came back with a bit of education and believed in education, just like Don John Dube. My father started a school, the first school of his kind in Mali by an individual with his own money in 1960, two weeks after Mali's independence. Mm. My father built that school with his own money. He was just a nurse mm. because he believed that there was no independence without education. Mm -hmm. Exactly what John Dube had done in 1900, what John Enokutel had done in 1900. That's why I tell people, you know, the spirit that got into John Enokutel in 1900, that spirit traveled across the continent to get into my father in the late 50s, for my father to do exactly like they did in 1960. Of course, they had more education than my father, but it's the spirit the same spirit that got into them. That without education, there is no independence. And I think our countries today are really relinquishing education, the right kind of education. Our countries are giving up on it. And if we are not careful, we are going to lose that independence that the older generation believed in. If we are not careful, we are going to lose that independence to the Chinese, to the Americans, to the French, to the British. We're going to lose that, that independence. Well, with so, the yep. kind of spirit, with the kind of spirit and, and teachings that you have. But, yes. Um, 
we're not gonna lose it. <laughs> I hope so. I really hope so. So this 150th anniversary should be a new resolve in us to reconnect with the spirit. That education is for independence. That education is not for self-enrichment to be above everybody, to be the individual who can go around beating that. No, no, we are people of community, Ubuntu. In my culture, we say Mogoya. We say, you come into the world in people's hands, you leave this world in dignity in people's hands too. Don't forget that. It's Mogoya. people who bring you into this world. That's <laughs> Mogoya. Mogoya is Ubuntu, Mogoya. Mogoya. Because Mogo is human being. Mogoya is the fact of being is the, the fact of being a person. They say you come into the world in people's hands. It's people who clean you up when you come into the world. People who make you clean and make you presentable and raise you so you could be part of a society. But when you die, do you bury yourself? No. People clean you up again and send you to the other world in dignity. That's the yeah. foundation of Mogoya. You have to believe in that. Thank you. Wow. Professor Kumar. Thank you so much. Um, I can only say what a privilege it has been to be part of uh, uh, the journey of exploring and discovering JL Dube. Um, we've been a small community of people who are just concerned about this continuously uh, here at UKZN. And um, I think of uh, Professor Heather Hughes, who's with us here, uh, Professor Cherif Keita, um, and then just a few of us and the team that prepares these lectures that have continuously uh, talking to one another, sharing ideas, sharing discoveries, archives and all that every year. But it's been a privilege also to be part of an institution um, like UKZN that has just given us the space to explore uh, Dube, to do these lectures. Now and again, giving us resources to make sure that this lecture is held, supported by the leaders in the schools that we have. It has been a joint effort, including the family that has been with us every time we are organizing this. I do want to say on behalf of my colleagues um, in the team, um, 2023 indeed, will be dedicated to the 150 years since Nogutela Dube was born. And we will work on that, we'll think about it. We need to make sure that we celebrate her life and take into account the proposals that have been made here in promoting scholarship on Nogutela as an epitome. In fact, through these lectures and all that, the Congregational Church, which is Dube and Nogutela's church, have actually started a program and named another project after Nogutela. There is work that is being done there as a result of this work that has been done here. So I'm just saying thank you so much. We invite all of you every year to join us in September. It's always on the second week of September that we hold the JL Dube lecture. And I want to salute my few co my colleagues, uh, Professor Rebohile Muletsane, Professor Busiso Masondo, Mr. Kumbulani Mgadi, Ms. Oli Zulu, and Kozum Kize. That's the team that has remained faithful and standing. Thank you very much. I salute you. And when you say that, we say, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, Zoom, the Zoom life has robbed us of, of, of Ulule thing, I'm telling you. And, <laughs> and, and just, I want to thank you with these words that, mm. As Professor Muletzane is answering you, there's another conversation going on on the, on the chat, talking to Nompumelelo Tabete, just saying that, you know, if history, history should be taught in, mm -hmm. in schools, but also taught in our languages, in Isizulu, in Zizuana, you know, even if we do speak in English, because mm -hmm. English is this a tool uh, of understanding but our languages have got another texture. Mogoya, Mogo, Umuntu, Mogoya, 
umuntu ngumuntu ngabantu mutu imutu kabatu it is a, a, an african language that goes across and 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 speaks the same language actually beyond the different words i thank you both and i and i want to invite mr langa dube uh, from the dube family to just say a message of support a message from the dube family mm. over to you mr dube Mute. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our lovely uh, facilitator and the coordinator of this uh, wonderful uh, conversation and the event, uh, Ma Molebatsi. Wow, I'm short of words to actually express my gratitude on behalf of the Dube family. Uh, heads up to you, Professor Sharif Keita, for the role that you've played over the years, you know, having to <clears throat> take this effort, you know, to trace our grandfather's footsteps. You know, you could have done and focus on other great leaders and pioneers, but you chose uh, the son of the soil our grandfather, JL, thanks. Thank you very much for your efforts. And again, I can't stop uh, thanking, actually, our own Mdunga, Seba Mandavizit, Professor Smiley's. Please don't, at any stage, ever get despondent you know, you've started this journey and you want to continue this journey, you know, to uplift and take this to another level. You know, you, you'll be surprised with this memorial lecture. You know, a lot of people have been questioning and raising very interesting, you know, issues to say, when are we going to see really um, Professor and his team, all the facilitators, you know, taking this to greater heights closer to where people are, you know, we've engaged in this uh, similar conversation. Let, let me then take this opportunity, I won't be long, but I, I, I want to thank uh, dearly to all the panelists, um, distinguished guests, and uh, all the people who are in attendance, you know, to this um, continuous uh, memorial lecture. Uh, we like to thank everyone, actually. Um, without leaving out uh, Professor Ralebo Hilemolizane, Prof Ralebo uh, for what you've done. <laughs> um, please continue. Again, to, on behalf of the Dube family, we, we were really honored, you know, of seeing our grandfather being um, not forgotten. You know, some of the great heroes and the heroines of this country have been forgotten. You know, there are a lot of voices, you know, that have been silenced. A lot of them having done meaningful contributions towards, you know, eradicating all the damage of uh, what we've experienced uh, in the past. Our painful past, I'm not going to dwell into it. We all know about it. Similar to my grandfather, he also, all the, 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 the route that he traversed and then the lengths and breadths um, and, and Pratt that he actually uh, traversed with uh, the, the, the dear wife, first wife, away to Unoktel, you know, trying to find solutions. And central to all their initiatives was to, was something very common, to say, what can we do to uplift a black child? And indeed, collectively, so, it was just one aspect, education. Education, they saw it as one of the most imperative tools, you know, to enable a black child to be able to transcend whatever challenges and to be able to stand on his or her own so that you'll be able to 
to do things and find things from home. We saw that through the establishment of Otlang, and you could actually tell and see that it was a collective effort of both of them. Yes, we, we, we most of the time people talk about JL as one of the political pioneers and all that. And little is said about Ogoko uh, Umamtima Dube together with our grandmother, uh, Angelina Dube, uh, of the role that they played. And, and, and as they were pushing and actually making what John Dube became. And, and indeed, our grandfather managed to achieve all what he, he, he did and all what he established, he in fact, still exists today, still being of benefit to the youth. And you can actually tell and see the relevance even up to this day, yet it's, it was started right at the turn of the last century. And, and with those words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I think it, it, it will be very much unfair for one to say, yes, we need, we want to see more of these uh, memorial uh, lectures. But again, we want to see continuation, uh, Prof. We, we need to have this conversation, continuous conversation that we need to take to all the corners you know, of our country to say, here are the people that actually made these contributions. Let's look at others. We have great researchers. Look at what Professor uh, Sharon Kate has done. Here's the research. Let us try and, 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 and bring and, 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 and nurture our own so that, because there's a lot that uh, we've lost uh, over centuries because of the, our, our schedule of apartheid. And really, we need to develop this culture of documenting and so that our youth, those that are still to be born, can actually reap these historical benefits. And, and also looking at you know, recollection. People like Professor, you, you, you've traversed this route, you, you, you've walked the footsteps, and I can assure you that we still have a lot of uh, information that is lying out there that needs to be re-imported uh, back home. We still have those uh, cultural artifacts that we need to bring it back here at home. You know, beautiful ornaments that our uh, grandmothers and grandfathers crafted. Mm -hmm. And they all deserve to be honored. And uh, with those words, I want to say on behalf of the Dube family, as we reflect about the life and times of our grandfather, we wish uh, to see our young people, you know, being uh, to be taken and to be given this opportunity to, to be able to access education. When we talk of education, not just education, but quality education, so that we can they can become their own fenders and their own responsible South Africans that are going to take this country to greater heights. Because should we forget about that, then this country I can assure everyone that is going to go to doomsday. And again, um, let, allow me to conclude by saying, as, as, as we work on this, uh, harnessing the works and the contributions of people like my grandfather, I think we need to take along, you know, and use and, and, and actually ask ourselves these fundamental questions to say, yes, as South Africans, We've been engulfed in, uh, uh, by this sketch of uh, the, the COVID-19. Now we're moving towards uh, another level. What is it that we, we need to do in, in answering the questions that still exist, that were answered, uh, that, that were actually questioned you know, a century ago? Your issues of land, those questions are, are, are still we're still asking similar questions. What is it that we're doing as South Africans to bring about answers? We, we, we are faced with questions to say, why is there so much of a youth unemployment in our country? Those questions, when are we going to give ourselves time to provide answers? And answers are there. One of the best strategies to provide these answers with these high levels of poverty, with this uh, uh, economic beneficiations 
like we know that our people are still just uh, uh, spectators of, of, of economic gainers. What are we saying about that? We, answers are there. We need to have time, give ourselves time to talk to politicians of all political parties to say, guys, let's have this conversation under one roof. Let us solve this problem that we have. Let's call all the farmers to find solutions about the, the, the land issues. Let's call all the, 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 the controllers of our economy in this country to say, guys, let's find solution to this. What is happening uh, about our economy? Hmm? Yes, our government uh, started, uh, they spoke about good policies of uh, developing township economy. What is actually happening about that? What can my grandfather say when he sees these people in the, the very same little uh, uh, economic activity taking place in the townships and rural areas? Seeing now, we're not seeing people who are, who are foreigners cannot come and, and do uh, economic activities in the country, but it, it needs to be channeled. Our people need to be the main beneficiaries. Where is the township economy? It's already been taken over by uh, the people that are, uh, who are actually of, of foreign descent. We need to accommodate them. Yes, we are in a democratic uh, dispensation, but these are some of the pertinent and critical questions that we actually sitting with answers that we need to really take up and say, okay, fine, our grandfather managed to say, here's the route that we need to take. Let us provide a, a, you know, a, a brightness because our people have been indebted into darkness because of lack of education. So they made their contribution by starting an institution like Wasabi. What then are we doing? We have highly sophisticated and, and professional people. What are we saying about those people? When are we going to have time to bring them together? We have a, a wide variety of, of, of uh, academia. We have the uh, professors. We are, can see that you are playing your role. Where are the engineers? When are we going to see them coming in? Our, our rural areas are still sitting with those uh, dusty uh, rural roads. When are, we, are they going to say, now is the time for us to plow back as a, a civil engineer, I need to also make a contribution and go back to say, here's another strategy that can actually make sure that our people have got roads, have got bridges and all those things. When are we having to have those uh, times? Indeed, those conversation, I think now is the time for us to have those conversation because our people are hungry and, and, uh, and, and they are angered by what they are seeing, these promises that have not been delivered. Let me end by saying, good people, let us continue inculcating this culture of documenting and also reaching out to our people to say, every one of us need to become a contributor in this area. I'd like to thank one and all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dube, the grandson of UJL Dube, a true Pan-Africanist. If there is one person who understood the, the fight for the freedom of all Black people, regardless of where they are, that they are Pan-Africanists, they are Pan-African, and that spirit, may it continue. May we see each other as com a community, an African community. If I go to Ghana, I want to be a Ghanaian. And if a Ghanaian comes into my country, I want to know what can I learn from you? What food can you teach me how to cook? Those are some of the things that Undade J.L. Dube in his time has taught us that he can go and speak to African-Americans as Africans. He can go and speak to Malians as Africans. So may we continue with that type of narrative. I'm going to now ask you to help me welcome um, Professor David Spurred, I hope I'm not butchering your name, 
Professor Spirit, uh, who is the Dean and Head of the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics to give us a vote of thanks. Natalia Malabazzi, our program director for this afternoon and evening, and Professor Nchantlan Kize, the DVC of the College of Humanities, as well as distinguished and invited guests, panel members, and members of the Dubé family. It is my privilege to have been asked to give a vote of thanks. I thank first the many colleagues who worked on planning and organizing this event, including especially Professor Simangaliso Kamalo and Libo Moletsani, and also Olise Wazulu and Shakila Zakurpasad, uh, who did uh, less, less visible work, but, uh, but absolutely crucial. Especially though today, I extend deep thanks to Professor Sharif Kater for his lecture. Professor Kater, today you shared a beautiful and very moving story with us. It was in part a story about how a set of initially fragile and apparently chance connections steadily strengthened into a network of supporters, allies, and even obligations, leading to your making a series of crucial contributions to our historical understanding of John Langalibalele Dube, as well as Nokutela and Angelina Dube. Professor Kaita, you told this story with studied modesty, but I say with respect that I think you overdid the modesty. This particular story of rediscovering important pieces of the puzzle of the story of the liberation of South Africa owes a great deal to your acute sensitivity to initially subtle clues, to the great depth and breadth of knowledge and understanding that enabled you to recognize them as clues at all, and to the considerable intellectual powers you command when you get to work. I was especially delighted to hear how members of the staff of the institutions that became UKZN notably the late Professor Fatima Mir, and ongoing cultural activities hosted by UKZN, notably the Durban International Film Festival, played a role in the early stages of this extraordinary story. Thank you, Professor Kaita, for your work helping recover and reassemble our history, and for the, your exemplary humanistic scholarship, and for the gracious and generous African humanism that you, you have shared with us today. Ordinarily, you would be standing on the invig invigorating South African soil and faced with a room full of smiling faces. And having been to a number of these lectures, I'm very confident that you would have had at least one standing ovation. I'm, I'm very sorry we can't give you that warmth in person, but we all look greatly forward to the day when, when you're with us again. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> wow, Professor Spirit, you're done. Yes. <laughs> I've never heard such an apt, straight to the point vote of things. I'm still waiting for, <laughs> for more. Um, thank, you. thank you for your words. Really humbling, really affirming. I, I want to... I know after, after the, the, the vote of thanks has been done, you're not supposed to say anything, but um, I am going to say something. <laughs> I want to thank Team UKZN for being so committed to strategies for Pan-African living. The kind of interventions that this university does from the departments of classics, uh, religion, right through to the Center for Creative Arts. We are always um, making sure that there is communication between mm -hmm. Africans, but also between people, meaningful communication, meaningful um, speaking to one another and speaking not just with our words, but speaking with our spirits. I really appreciate that. So having said that, I would just like to say, we are everyday people in the world, left alone, left behind, meet again, encounter new traces. We are everything. And we are everywhere. We traveler, warrior, journey people who are welcome to these pages. 
This is where we are. Traveler, warrior, journey man, troubled. Warrior, journey woman, tired. Troubled and tired, but trying into the limitless skies in pursuit of roots and truth. Journey man, journey woman, what are your foundations? What are your formulations? Because I too, I am searching for my formations. I am searching. And if any of you traveler, warrior, journey people ever get to that other side, tell them that we were made of flesh and the blues. Tell them that we were crafted into flesh and loss and lies many times, but tell them too that we were woven into long tapestries who hold us intact when we cannot hold ourselves. Tell them that we were made of flesh and love and hope and music and the spirits of the dead who do not die. Thank you. My name is Natalia Mulebazi. It has been an honor and a privilege to navigate you through this very important program of the 2021 John Langalibalele Dube Memorial Lecture. May we continue to do the work that is meaningful, that is relevant. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Remember that this conversation is recorded. It's on YouTube. If you go to the UKZN YouTube, um, it is there for the archive of the future. Thank you and good night.